I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. I, I invited myself, but. <laughs> and I, I'd like to thank George, especially because, in fact, George kind of covered the waterfront in terms of generally in the hypertension guidelines. The uh, um, and um, and I so I'm going to kind of skim on that, which is to point out that um, right. That's who I am, and the uh, is is to try to then apply some of the hypertension guidelines to to patients. These are my disclosures. And we're mostly going to be using um, hypertension Canada guidelines as a basis for essentially all the things I'm going to be telling you. And what I'm going to be doing then is to underline probably some of the concepts that were, were uh, raised in the first session and, and by Dr. Dresser and try to put them in the context in the management of the individual patient with hypertension. Because after all, I think there's, what, 162 Hypertension Canada guidelines, which are important for me and George and to know chapter and verse, but probably not as important because if I can say it, take a really, I don't think that's me, but the, uh, the, the uh, kind of, but to take a Captain Obvious approach to it, after all, you don't treat the Hypertension Canada's guidelines, you do treat one patient at a time. And I'm going to choose five patient profiles which, which reflect considerations of, of mostly choice of antihypertensive management uh, approaches in the setting of the other considerations, so then beyond uncomplicated hypertension. And in some ways building on, on George's comments because, in fact, thinking through the 20 minutes. I mean, what George, I think, pointed out is it's a misnomer. I mean, every patient you talked about, George, was anything but uncomplicated. They were all individual patients. So let's start with Isabel. And, and so the first three cases I'm going to point out, and forgive the feminine focus, my laboratory in Winnipeg is now called Women's Health. The, uh, and they're all post-menopausal, not just reflecting that I'm middle-aged or beyond. But the, uh, so this is Isabel, persistently elevated systolic blood pressure, as you can read along, in the 140 range. Diastolics are perfectly fine. Skinny, normal blood pressure, or sorry, everything that you checked was fine in terms of CBC, fasting blood sugar, LDL cholesterol, very active in the church. The, uh, didn't like the idea of, of uh, starting on medication when you raised it after coming from a hypertension meeting and said, well, the bottom number is the more important one. And I realize I'm talking to a younger audience, but when I was growing up, it really was diastolic blood pressure that was a focus. And that, the, that it was new information in terms of what the risk of systolic hypertension was. So first of all, I won't even ask the group the question because you heard it from Dr. Rabbi, you heard it from Dr. Dresser in terms of the relative risk of systolic hypertension. But the consideration is then what classes of blood pressure medications would you consider for this lady with systolic hypertension? Let me just point out what you, what you know, which is that patients with systolic hypertension have the, uh, have the biggest risk. This is, an old, this is old data, but just point out that if you look at, these are all diastolic blood pressures here, systolic blood pressures. And the part of the block that stands out the highest is that patient not only with, with, the, with systolic elevation that's isolated. So isolated systolic hypertension, that was a big deal 20 years ago in terms of appreciation that those patients really require treatment and the, the SHEP study, the systolic hypertension, the elderly program study really identified that this entity was important and there was more to diastolic blood pressure, but we should remember that that concept is still, was still 
relatively new 20 years ago. What has been pointed out a couple times then is, is that we now operate not on a single number, 140 over 90, but we think in terms of thresholds and targets. There being three thresholds, four targets, the, uh, and, and for everybody who's had this beat into their head for the last uh, hour or so, what's Isabel's blood pressure target? Or sorry, blood pressure threshold? Is she a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk patient? She's high risk, the, uh, and she fell into the 27% or 28% of the sprint patients who were over the age of 75. And as has been pointed out by Dr. Rabi, then she is that category, age greater than 75, which then qualified her to be a high risk patient with a threshold for initiating therapy of 130 millimeters of mercury and a target based on AOBP uh, of 120. How many people use AOBP in their, uh, in their clinics? Okay, so for those of you who use that, then that is the number. Probably for those of you who don't, the number that I typically suggest is higher than that is your, uh, is your uh, uh, target, your threshold. So the uh, probably, and maybe up to 10 millimeters of mercury higher than that. And what Dr. Ravi has pointed out that there, it does come with a cost, that higher, that lower target, which is renal deterioration, potassium abnormalities, and, and more risk of hypotension. All right, so that is on the choices. Now, the, uh, how many people would start her on a long-acting diuretic? How many people would start her on a calcium channel blocker? How many would start her on a RAS inhibitor? How many on a beta blocker? How many in a single pill combination? How many people want lunch? The, uh, it turns out in a little bit of an anomaly for patients with systolic hypertension, the current Canada, Hypertension Canada guidelines would suggest that there are only three choices. And whoops, what did I do? Which is an ARB, not an ACE inhibitor, a long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, or a thiazide-type diuretic. On the other hand, I would point out to you that there is a little bit of a discrepancy currently in the hypertension Canada guidelines, which I'm sure is going to get fixed. And in fact, these patients, as treated in the SPRINT study, could have received any of these classes of drugs. Probably not beta blockers over the age of 60, but these would be the thiazide, thiazide like, including the, with the long actings preferred, an ACE inhibitor and ARB, a long acting CCB, not a beta blocker over the age of 60. And as uh, Dr. Dresser alluded to, I mean, in my book, this would be a patient uh, who would start on a low dose single pill combination using a quarter pill stra dual strategy. Maybe we can talk about that during the question period. But the, uh, so that the, the choice though is probably wide open, but this is somebody for whom therapy has been shown to improve or decreased cardiovascular event rates. Okay, those are choices. All right, let's, let's move on to the other end of the spectrum. This is Valerie, 38 years old. Persistent elevations in blood pressure, 142 over 90, and also, I think a case that, uh, kind of a case that uh, was raised during the question periods by Doreen. Normal blood pressure, or sorry, blood work, normal blood work, Physical exam, LDL looks fine, fasting blood sugar was fine. Blood pressures were, were persistently elevated the, uh, in the office, but turns out that they're elevated in the pharmacy and at home as well, 140, 145 range. Uh, there is a family history of, of um, MIs, age 58, mothers on blood pressure medications, age 66. Although they were both smokers, had bad lifestyles. All right, so question. The, uh, 
you're going to give lifestyle advice, and we're going to deal with that in a, a moment or two. But how many people would start her on medications at this point? Yep, blood pressure's in the 140 to 150 range. How many people wouldn't? One brave soul. The, uh... now, now, I guess the question to ask then, for those of you who would start her on medication but aren't putting your hand up for whatever reason is, is a consideration of what's in it for that patient. So these are the, uh, so what's in it is calculated by numbers needed to treat. I don't know how familiar you are with that approach, which is how many patients do you need to treat for hypertension, for that level of hypertension to avoid one MI? So if you take a, a uh, 55 year old guy and look in stage one hypertension, which is what we're talking about for Valerie, the number needed to treat with no other risk factors are about 60. With more than one risk factor, it goes down. And this is the idea of, of a high risk patient. This is what translated into the, was proven by the SPRINT study to be operational, that the greater the global cardiovascular risk, the more the benefit for lowering blood pressure. So that's for a middle-aged guy. What is it for Valerie? How many people say it's 60? How many people say it's 100? How many people say it's 200? 300? Her number is more than 500. So you're going to have to treat more than 500 people like Valerie for 10 years to avoid when am I? And you're probably going to harm about a little, harm a little, about 100 people of them, not very much, but probably harm five or 10 more significantly for avoiding one MI. So that that is reflected in the guidelines and Dr. Rabi talked about it and this was just kind of giving the explanation that Valerie is a low risk hypertensive and for that her threshold for initiating therapy Drug therapy is 160 over 100. Doesn't take away from the health behavior changes, which should be, uh, but in terms of drug therapy and it whole has to do with what's in it. All right, so five more minutes. This is Joyce, 86 year old, a little bit more on the frail side, assisted living resident, long standing hypertension. Gen well controlled on three agents, Ramaprol, hydrochlorothiazide, and terazosin, presents at the urging of the family. She had a couple falls. It, somebody was asking about falls. The, uh, when you examine her, blood pressure it was a little high in terms of his sprint target, but drops to 96 over 50. So what's her target? All right, how many people say her target is 120 sprint? No. How many people say 130, kind of sprint adjusted? Maybe a little buy-in. How many 140? High 150? For me, her target would be about 150. The uh, why? This is sprint. Is she a sprint patient? No. The, uh, Sprint does include patients with a high risk category greater than 75, but excluded patients who are the institutionalized elderly as an index of, of so then Sprint doesn't apply. And typically in that setting, although it's, uh, there is no set guideline, I tend to revert to the, what's called the HIVET uh, guideline, which is threshold of 160, target of 150. And in terms of how I manage them, I don't do this globally, but this is the classic for that old maxim, start low and go slow. I monitor, and actually I treat, although this is me, not Hypertension Canada, based on standing blood pressures, one minute standing blood pressures in those patients. As I said, I use a conservative blood pressure target, that's 150, threshold 160, target 150. I only use longer acting agents in this patient. That is, she was on hydrochlorothiazide and Ramapril that are, Ramapril being the best 
twice a day ACE inhibitor there is, but we don't treat patients twice a day. So go to a longer acting if you're going to use an ACE inhibitor. And for diuretics, as you've heard, hydrochlorothiazide is not preferred. It's in dapamide or for more severe changes uh, or better, uh, more effective control, uh, chlorothalidone. And avoid drugs that cause orthostatic hypotension. Not exactly clear why she was on prazosin to start with but certainly not a good drug in patients who've already got a problem with orthostatic hypotension. All right, so let's do a, at least one more. Let's start with Richard. Smoker, obese, sedentary, has some OA, taking uh, NSAIDs, hypertension, on a dihydropyridine CCB, Diuretic was started, related peripheral edema, probably from the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, by the way, in which diuretics do not help, DHP uh, edema. Blood pressure is now okay. He, he's on a NOAC or a DOAC, right, a novel anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation, which developed several months ago. LDLs have been okay, but now he presents with gout and a blood pressure which is still not at target. So what are the considerations then for, for this more complicated patient? So what lifestyle or health behavior advice would you give? And what classes of drugs would you consider? And I'll go briefly through that. This is a listing of Hypertension Canada's uh, recommendation for health behaviors on sodium, physical activity, attaining good body weight, healthy diet, which is a DASH-type diet, and uh, low-risk alcohol consumption, reduced waist circumference. What's important to point out is not the details of this, but to point out that they're all effective in reducing blood pressure to the same extent as a standard dose of monotherapy, and they're all listed here, and they're all in the range of, what, 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury reduction on average, which is about the same effect as you get from a standard dose of a single antihypertensive drug. So never forget the, about the utility of, of, uh, of, mono, of starting therapies. So what drug are you going to start on? And these would be the considerations, and let's just go through them briefly because these are the considerations that you're going to be making on on all of these patients with now complicated hypertension, which as Dr. Dresser said is you're matching up based on comorbidities. So beta blockers might be a good idea for rate control. Remember he's got AFib, but, but there, is, there is some suggestion that beta blockers do not reduce cardiovascular risk in smokers, so probably not a good choice. ACEs and ARBs, probably an okay choice especially in a patient with gout. No real impact on uric acid. A losartan metabolite actually will lower uric acid a little bit. Doesn't rate, rate control, but would be an important addition because remember, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but not diuretics, help reduce the peripheral edema associated with, with, with CCBs. So a CCB might be a good choice. No impact on uric acid would have some benefit in terms of rate control, depending if you're using diltiazem or verapamil, not, uh, not amlodipine. Diuretics, you're probably going to stay away from, at least initially, although appreciate as you get to a three or four drug combination. If you got to it, then you might need to, but then you'd have to have uh, add hypouricemic therapy as well. So what would I do? This would be a patient I'd use a RAS inhibitor CCB combo. The, uh, either in the absence of real problems with rate control, you could use any of the, uh, the available ones. I, uh, we can talk about single pill combinations. So for me, that would be either a telmisartan amlodipine combination or the perindopril amlodipine single pill combinations. Can I go one minute? I'll go one minute more. All right, last guy, Doug. Comes in, long-standing patient, comes in with a uh, pulled in by, uh, or sorry, come, his wife was a long-standing patient, but the uh, pulls in her husband, which is always a bad sign. 
He's been in the ER, he had a GI bleed, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, moderate uh, chronic kidney disease. It could have been due to diabetes or hypertension or long set OTC use, has some, at least microalbuminuria, has a dry cough, or sorry, was started on an ACE inhibitor along with antihyperglycemics, has a dry cough and blood pressure, which is not quite a target for him. Remember, he's diabetes, so his target is 130 over 80. <coughs> So just to remind you that in the absence of this patient having nephropathy, that in terms of blood pressure control, you can use any of the classes of drugs. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, dihydropyridine, CCBs, thiazide, diuretics, the, uh, and actually a single pill combination with a ACE inhibitor, CCB, is the preferred two drug combination for this patient. On the other hand, with diabetic nephropathy, then this is the population for which ACE inhibitors and ARBs are, are the preferred over all the other classes of drugs. So in summary, what I've done is given you a Cook's tour through complicated hypertension, actually continuing what Dr. Dresser was talking about, but in the context of specific patients, and point out that, that there are no uncomplicated patients in, in hypertension, and primarily both your targets, thresholds, and the choice of drugs often needs to be, mostly needs to be based on considerations of overall cardiovascular risk. And that which drug you're gonna choose really needs to be predicated on considerations of, of comorbidities, the complications, either related to hypertension or not, uh, and adverse effects. But to remind you that, that the health behavior changes that we often pay lip service to are integral to the management of all patients with hypertension for all atherosclerotic risk reduction, you know, be they hypertensive or not. Thanks.